So I'm going to give you a quick overview of uh, one thing that will, for sure, uh, avoid uh, shipping sheep, <laughs> as uh, Uncle Bo uh, said today. So I will give you a quick overview of uh, how our, our CI infrastructure works and what the evolution was, I, and also about uh, some other uh, services that we provide in our team. Um, I guess that most of you at least have a general idea of what uh, continuous integration is, but in general is providing a set of actions that execute after you kind of commit uh, changes to your repository. Uh, mainly, we use two of these uh, mechanisms. One is uh, GitLab CI, as uh, my, my colleague explained on the previous talk. And we also have Jenkins as a, as a service. This is just, a, just an example of how GitLab CI looks like. Uh, the main reason why we we need this, I mean, can be just summarized with this uh, Atlas extract from an, uh, from an abstract. And mainly because uh, even ourselves, uh, supporting GitLab at CERN, use GitLab CI to upgrade, the, to upgrade our own instance. So any configuration change, anything that we do to our, to our setup, uh, goes through GitLab CI. Which, I mean, for, for our, our, our team, is uh, the easiest way. Because it's uh, completely integrated with GitLab, so it eases our, our job. At our version control systems team, we do not only provide a, a solution for GitLab CI, we are also in charge of the, of the GitLab instance that we maintain. We also provide a Docker registry integrated with, uh, with our GitLab instance. We also provide artifact storage integrated with our GitLab instance. But apart from that, I mean, for some use cases, um, people might not uh, find our solutions the best, might not have the same features that they expected, from historical reasons or whatever. So that's why we also provide a Nexus for artifact, artifactory equivalent uh, storage. And uh, Jenkins, in case uh, GitLab CI is not enough. We also provide a setup of GitLab shared runners. I will come back shortly of what a uh, GitLab runner is. And uh, yeah, that's mostly it. We also support uh, SVM, but we're in the, we are in the path of closing the, the service. To give you a quick overview of how it evolved over time, we have uh, around 15,000 active users, and uh, we run around 100,000 jobs uh, per month. We divide into types of jobs that, uh, that we have, and we, I, we will explain afterwards why this, uh, this division. We have around 30 shared runners. This keeps evolving over time, so it might, it might not be accurate as, to, as of today. And we allow users to register their private runners. So right now we have around 300. And well, it's just uh, to show you the correlation between uh, the total CI jobs keeps increasing over time, as well as the number of GitLab projects, especially after we announced the SVN uh, closure plan. Uh, around this uh, GitLab shared uh, runners, we have three different types. We provide a general purpose default uh, runner type that serves most of the use cases. And for Docker build runners, we have a different type. Uh, I will explain by, uh, afterwards why this, this is uh, a need right now. We also have privileged runners that uh, have access to the root machine in case the, the other two are not enough. Uh, as I said, we provide Jenkins as an alternative for some other use cases as an OpenShift template for our uh, PAS uh, service at, the, at CERN provided by our colleagues in the same team. And Nexus artifact storage uh, as well. Uh, the GitLab share runners uh, has, have, evolved, uh, have evolved over time quite a lot. At the beginning, they were puppet managed machines that were kind of complicated to, to maintain, especially because of the host group configuration. Uh, for this, we were using our own puppet module that we still maintain as, as of today. And this is still the recommended way of providing, uh, providing uh, an easy solution for the users that want to set up their private runners. Of course, this is not the only one, but this is the uh, recommendation from our team. And, we had to maintain, I mean, we have to install uh, these machines one by one. And this is important because afterwards, the solutions that, uh, that came uh, solved uh, this problem. We tested, tested several options and for uh, quite a lot, of, a lot of time, not only since I'm here, um, even before, uh, to kind of uh, replace the puppet managed machines. One of the solutions that we tested was uh, Kubernetes. Um, we had a lot of faith on this one because, of course, we have a CERN cloud uh, here uh, at CERN. And uh, using the OpenStack Magnum service, uh, it was 
quite easy to scale the, the infrastructure that we were maintaining. But the problem was that at that time when we were testing it, uh, GitLab Runner, which has different executors depending on where you want to run your CI jobs, did not uh, meet our expe ex expectations uh, regarding the, um, the features that it provided. So I mentioned Kubernetes. I mentioned OpenStack uh, Magnum Service. Our main goal with the OpenStack Magnum uh, alternatives were just to get the cloud support and ease the, sc the scaling. We didn't matter uh, about uh, what we were actually using. We just wanted to make uh, our jobs as easy as possible. Another option that we tested was uh, using Docker Machine, again, using the, open, the service cloud, but uh, using the OpenStack Nova, Nova service instead of Magnum for providing uh, VMs on the go to run our jobs there. But again, the, we depend on the slow provision and times of, uh, of our VMs. Um, we are affected by the API downtimes that, well, they are not useful, but we still have them. And uh, we are uh, unable to cache images, which I will come back afterwards about uh, this importance. The selected alternatives that uh, replace the puppet managed machines are using OpenStack uh, Magnum clusters, spe uh, specifically using Swarm, but uh, that's not important, what the, the Swarm thingy, and Docker machine for uh, another type of runner. Using the Docker executor, which uh, meets the highest uh, var variety of uh, features that we want to provide to our users. Uh, we had a problem here. For running certain jobs, you need to have privileged access to the, to the machine. And since these are shared, uh, some users could affect some others uh, in their performance and whatever they were doing. So we wanted to have isolated uh, kind of sandboxes for every user. That's why the division comes. We have default runners which run in unprivileged mode, and these have a CBMFS automating. Docker build runners, which run in privileged mode, but uh, they are limited. Privileged runners, these are still experimental, and as the name says, they are running in privileged mode with uh, Docker machine. And still private runners that are available for users in different ways, one is the Papel module. The normal runners um, are deployed through a Swarm uh, cluster. We are not using Swarm explicitly, we are just using it as a way of providing VMs pre-configured and ready to go. Uh, we configure them with Ansible. Uh, they run in privileged mode, as I said. Uh, we have CMFS automated on these uh, containers. CMFS is a um, certain specific uh, file system, read-only, that uh, some experiments need to run their jobs with some extra tools that they, have to, they need for them. And it has Docker image cleanup. We want to cache some specific images that are used uh, a lot over time. We don't want to keep pulling them all the time. And once you free up a space, because some of the images might be that big that uh, collapse the, the space in, that we have. Docker build runners are deployed the same way, but this run in privileged mode. They use a specific image that we build ourselves. It's limited in the, in the, mean, in the sense of uh, people cannot escape of what the image is doing. You cannot override the entry point of, the, of your job. You cannot ex escape what the, um, what the image is actually proposed to, to do. Uh, with a limit, limited set of variables, you can uh, define your, your local build. Then, uh, I mean, the advantages of using uh, Magnum as a way of providing uh, pre-configured machines is that we can prepare a pool of uh, runners at once instead of just uh, deploying them one by one. And the configuration, pre-configuration is way easier because we avoid some extra configura configuration that we had to apply for the puppet managed machine. For the privileged runners, which are still experimental at CERN, uh, they have evolved over time, uh, first using uh, virtualization nested VMs, uh, nested VMs, but they, didn't, they did not meet uh, our expectations in terms of performance. So using Docker machine and with our own image, which overrides the, um, the Docker machine version that we currently have on this image upstream. We add some uh, features that are not yet released uh, in the OpenStack uh, driver at uh, the Docker machine binary. Uh, we use, we use uh, OpenStack Nova service, and this is really important, uh, this remark here, because without this change, we cannot avoid the certain DNS registration. And this takes uh, around 15, uh, 15 minutes or even 20. Without these, we can speed up uh, to one or two minutes 
so it's uh, quite an improvement. We also provide some other services, as I said before, the GitLab registry integrated with uh, GitLab and the artifact storage. They, those use uh, the S3 storage service that we have at, at CERN. We also provide Jenkins OpenShift template. Uh, it's self-service. It uh, covers some use cases that were not uh, possible with GitLab CI because of some missing features that are not yet ready, will never be, we don't know. Depends on GitLab stream. We have around 60 instances. And uh, this, uh, this is just a matter of uh, the use cases or because of historical reasons that teams were already using this before. Nexus Artifact Storage covers the use cases that cannot be accomplished with the, um, the, the um, GitLab integrated solution and uh, for storing uh, uh, components and uh, artifacts uh, for future builds or just to keep, uh, to keep it somewhere here at CERN. Something as uh, what uh, Linux uh, software does uh, for RPMs uh, at CERN. Our future plans uh, include um, improving monitoring. This is uh, already on the works. We use uh, Prometheus for monitoring, and, well, Grafana. And we want to, to recover automatically to some of the alarms that they, we have in place. We want to recover it automatically with several actions. So even if no one is uh, here to, to take a look at it, we can keep the fire down. And we, all, we want to also improve the auto-scaling so we can adapt uh, um, our CI infrastructure, the, the amount of runners, to the CI load. We want to keep improving the um, provisioning time of privileged runners. Uh, with a, pool, a, a pool of already prepared uh, runners in order to take, out, uh, to take uh, your jobs. Um, our main goal uh, is just to have an infra infrastructure as close as uh, what, um, what GitLab.com uh, has uh, right now. They just have a Docker machine uh, configuration and they create a VM just every time you, you run your job. So the privileged runner version tries to somehow uh, have a similar setup to, to what they do. Or, uh, right now it's not uh, yet possible, but, uh, but yes. And currently we are in, in investing some time in Kaniko. Kaniko is some way of, uh, it's a tool that uh, provides uh, a way of Docker, uh, the building Docker images without unprivileged mode, which is why we require the, um, the Docker build specific runners. So our next, uh, in, the, in the near future, our next goal would be to remove the Docker build runners with uh, this kind of solution. So we end up uh, reducing the amount of, uh, of runners that uh, we currently have. So without further ado, I mean, if you have any questions, and even if I, don't, I cannot answer right now because of time constraints, uh, I will be around. So if you want to have a quick chat, just say. Uh, Thank you very much.